Okay, one and all, welcome again in week three. This time we are going to focus on relationship between money and happiness. We have one specific goal for this week, which is see the potential impact of money on consumers. Mainly we are going to focus on well-being of consumers. Relationship between money and happiness will be investigated from a perspective, macro perspective. Also, we are going to investigate relationship between money and happiness and in terms of psychological mechanisms. And finally, we are going to focus on consumerism and wealth. What is really important at this point that you have to remember that um, in September, uh, September 23, there will be a e-lecture on pricing. So next week, on Wednesday, there's no meeting. All of us, we are going to watch this e-lecture on pricing and answer to some questions. Please take into account that later on, those questions that will uh, come along with the pricing lecture may also be asked during the exam. And finally, uh, the last organization matter is that try to think about your Nudge project. So it's a good time to report also a Nudge project group on Canvas. It can be the same group as you've been uh, working with uh, on the e-lecture. For this week and also for next week we have numerous readings. So first of all chapter 9 and 10 from the textbook. We have uh, article about curing consumerism uh, article by Rosenzweig and Gilovich about remorse uh, and a uh, large important article by Dunn and colleagues about uh, relationship between money and happiness. And finally, chapter 13 from the textbook. At this point I can also recommend reading this book by Dunn and Norton about mm, uh, happy money, the new science of smarter spending. In this book you will find interesting uh, suggestions on how to increase happiness through spending money wisely. Okay, so people, when earning money, they sometimes think, or very often think, uh, how they are going to spend their money. And as you probably expect, there can be a relationship between happiness and money, but it's more complex than typically uh, we think. This slide indicates how many people are happy depending on the income. We have poorer people with uh, income under $20,000. What's important in this case, it's a study in 2004. So probably nowadays, after 16 years from uh, when the study was published, those numbers probably may look differently. But nevertheless, uh, it's really interesting pattern to um, to analyze. So if you take a look at how many people are not happy uh, if their income is uh, low, it's a relatively large group of people. So in this group we have 17, around 17% 17 of people who are not happy and then this percentage decreases. Only 5% of people with an income um, around 90 thousand uh, dollars and over are unhappy. The same situation, so the differences, can also be seen when we analyze very happy people. Very low number of very happy people uh, in the group of uh, people earning uh, not much, under twenty thousand dollars, and a relatively large group of people, around forty three percent, who earn uh, $90,000 or more. That says something about the relationship between money and happiness, but of course this pattern uh, is more complex, as you will see uh, later on. The complexity can be seen when we analyze those values, pretty happy people, because as you see, the values are pretty similar to each other. 50, around 50%, maybe a little bit less uh, um, in the uh, middle group, uh, but this value 
uh, it's slightly higher uh, in the group of uh, people with high income. So the question is that why this value is constant? Let's take a look specifically at this part of the table. It shows that basically if uh, income of a group of people is um, higher than 50 and then increases to 90 and over, there are no large differences between those two groups. So it suggests that at the time, in 2004, uh, earning around $50,000 or more was uh, enough to have uh, more or less happy life. So at least uh, no huge differences uh, between people earning 50, um, 70 and very rich people over $90,000. Why do you think what's, why that's the case? Major conclusion that we can build here is that basically little money makes us unhappy. It's good to have enough money uh, and not always lots of money makes us happier, but what we can conclude based on this data is that little money makes us unhappy. One of the explanations or answer to the question that I asked before is this graph. It shows that under some conditions uh, happiness does not increase. So in this case the threshold is around $50,000 of annual income. As you see here this graph shows utility curve. It rapidly increases, um, the happiness rapidly increases if the annual income also increases, but the increase uh, changes, so the dynamics of the change are lower when we take into account uh, groups of people between $50,000 uh, and 5 million, for instance. Okay. Let's take a closer look at the relationship between money and happiness. What Kahneman found is that income has a reliable but remarkably weak effect on happiness within nations. Depending on the country, it can be low uh, income countries or large income countries, it's between 0.15 and 0.3, so rather low to medium uh, effect size. This correlation becomes weaker once we analyze population where basic needs are met. So where uh, people have enough regarding what they need. Another effect they found uh, in the research is that if we use different measures so experience happiness versus um, global measure of, uh, of well-being, then this relationship changes. So it's slightly weaker uh, for um, measures that strictly focus on happiness. For more global well-being assessment related to not only happiness itself, uh, so uh, how well people feel, but also to what extent they are satisfied with their family life and so on, uh, this relationship between money and uh, those global measures uh, changes. On average, we can conclude that uh, reported global judgment of life satisfaction or happiness have not changed much over the last uh, decades. So it means that uh, uh, the level of happiness across different countries is more or less stable. And that also it's stable due to the fact that um, there are large differences between countries and also um, incomes of uh, specific countries, they rapidly increased um, in the uh, previous times. What can we see, and that's another pattern, is that little money makes us unhappy. It was possible to find everywhere around the globe. They concluded, based on the data, that over a certain threshold, 
In the US, it's uh, between $50,000 and seventy-five. Uh, more money does not mm, further increase happiness. Also, what they found is that the way how we measure happiness, whether we focus on positive emotions only or satisfaction with family and more global measures, that also changes uh, correlations between money and happiness. So you can ask a question, why income has such a weak effect on subjective well-being. First of all, we can take into account uh, relative income hypotheses and to some extent this hypothesis tells a little bit more about this relationship. We can also take into account habituation effect, time usage, cognitive changes effect and the just out of reach effect. And in this lecture, I'm going to focus on four of them. Arley describes in his book this relative income hypothesis. What it's about? It's about the fact that people typically are assessing not um, absolute value of the income, but rather a relative value of the income. So, basically, we compare to each other. They also found that people are used to uh, different bonuses. So, relatively, relative income is more important because we all get different bonuses, either from the company or from the government. So, not the absolute value means for us, but also what we uh, else uh, what we can get, and also we can compare to each other based on those bonuses. Due to the fact that this relative income is more important to us than the absolute uh, income, it also explains the fact that even though societies uh, become richer and richer, people do not become happier every year. Basically, uh, even if we observe some uh, values, they are basically not meaningful. Uh, take a look at this comic. As you see here, this family analyzes their income. And they say, as you see, we not only kept uh, up with the chances, but su surpassed them. Next up, the Nelsons. It means that uh, for families or for people, this relative uh, income is more important because if we compare um, ourselves to other people, other families, that can help us to build our happiness. Think for a second about this data. See uh, the comparison between CEOs and average worker salary. If we um, exclude public bonuses, the difference between 76 and 1993 is that in 96 sorry 76 um, average worker was earning 30 times less than CEO than in 1993 131 times and if we would include public bonuses now it's uh, almost uh, 400 times as much as a uh, average uh, salary. Of course, this data are from 2009, so the question is that probably nowadays is even more. So, yeah, why do you think or how that can influence uh, our perspective of uh, relative income? Is relative income still important? Would we uh, compare ourselves to CEOs? If we would start to compare ourselves to CEOs, would be uh, we we'll, would be uh, uh, more happy or less happy?
we've focused quite a lot on money. Dan and his colleagues, they were trying to investigate what makes people happy, what kind of activities. In the middle, we have a line, it's a centered mean. So uh, values to the left are related to uh, uh, low happiness and activities on the right hand side are related to uh, high happiness. So for instance, uh, working doesn't uh, make people uh, happier. The same uh, working on a home computer or commuting or traveling. But activities like reading, taking care of children makes people happy. Here, between those activities, you can also find spending. Shopping or different errands that can uh, involve spending money. Of course, making love in this case, it's an activity that uh, makes people uh, very, very happy, but not many people reported that as an activity that uh, heavily influences their happiness. Next to it, we have exercising or having a conversation. This is what uh, makes people happy. So as you see, spending money is not as important as the other activities. Those more important activities, they focus on relationships with other humans. That's important. Okay, let's get back to discussing this relationship between money and happiness. One of the explanations of the weak relationship between money and happiness is this habituation effect. It's related to our behavior that if we earn more, then we also tend to, tend to spend more. So increase in income leads to increase in consumption opportunities. Basically, people buy more material goods. And obviously, it's not really good for happiness. And of course, yet individuals get used to materials, uh, material goods very fast. As a result, above specific level of consumption, so once all the basic needs are um, satisfied, additional spending on material goods does not increase happiness. There was an interesting study on longitudinal um, effects of uh, um, moving and buying houses. Uh, it was published by uh, Nakazata and all, and what they found, moving significantly increased house satisfaction. But the effect wore off a little, but reminded after five years. However, did not affect life satisfaction. So you can conclude that if people move from smaller house to the bigger house, they may be satisfied where, with, the high, with the house they uh, live in, but it does not affect their general life satisfaction. So even though we can be happy about things, but this happiness of, uh, about things does not impact our satisfaction with life. Okay, let's move on. Third phenomenon that explains this weak relationship between money and happiness is time usage. What was found in research, also by Kahneman and his colleagues, is that people with greater income tend to spend more time at work, compulsory activities uh, related to uh, childcare, shopping, uh, but basically uh, they have a little bit less time for passive um, a leisure. They have time, uh, more time for uh, exercises, but less time for passive time uh, leisures. On the other hand, they also found that when we um, spend more time at work, as you probably remember that from uh, one of the slides before, work does not make us um, happy. Uh, and in this case, they also found that those activities like uh, 
uh, work uh, are related to higher goal attainment. On the other hand, work and compulsory non-work activities are related to high intention and stress level. So if we know from other studies that work, working does not uh, make people um, uh, happy uh, or taking care of children, maybe it's related to slightly increased level of happiness, but it's not something that people love to do. In this case, we can nicely connect that with this effect. And that explains why working or doing uh, non-work related activities does not strongly increase um, the happiness uh, in this group of people uh, with greater income. Thus, it explained why increased income is more highly correlated with life satisfaction than experience happiness. We can say that, yeah, I'm doing well versus the things I'm doing uh, actually uh, that make me happy. So uh, people with uh, higher income, they can be more satisfied with their life. So uh, they can uh, feel themselves as a worthy person due to different achievements at work. On the other hand, they are more stressed, uh, they feel high tension, and thus the level of experience happiness may be lower than uh, in other groups. Let's take a look at, at the data. It's a pretty complex pattern. It shows relationship between uh, different activities and income. Let's take into account uh, men as a group. As you see here, uh, people with men with lower income, they have not much time on active leisure, like exercise. They have slightly less time than richer individuals on eating, but they have more time on uh, passive leisure. For instance, watching TV. And also, uh, that differs them from the others. Uh, they have a little bit less uh, time, or they allocate less time, into uh, work and commuting. So, we have here two conflicting motives. On one hand, people who have lower income, they have less time for active leisure, also less time for eating. But on the other hand, they don't have to do so many compulsory activities. They don't have to work so much as people with higher income. So if you take a look at um, values for rich people, more than $100,000, you will see that they have more time for leisure, more time uh, for eating than the uh, less income uh, uh, individuals. But also they have uh, less time for passive leisure, but they allocate more time for compulsory activities and they spend more time working. So, as you also can see in this graph, uh, those values uh, to which a green arrow is attached, so uh, on the left-hand side, those activities are related to increased level of happiness. So being able to exercise a lot, eat a lot, spend time on eating makes us happy. On the other hand, uh, rich people have um, need to spend more time uh, on activities that are related to increased uh, stress level. In group of females, uh, the pattern is uh, pretty similar, especially on the left-hand side. Uh, it's slightly different for compulsory activities, because in many cases, like taking care of children, this is a duty of, uh, of females, and that's why we have more or less even distribution uh, for each income group for less than $20,000 uh, or more than 100. Below um, those uh, data, we have also average level of uh, happiness related to those activities. 
So as you see here, uh, active leisure, on average, uh, is related to increased level of uh, being happy, the same for eating. Uh, passive leisure, it's slightly lower, but significantly lower um, happiness for work and commute. It's only 3.94. And finally, let's take into account this aspect that explains this weak relationship between money and happiness. The previous slides show that this relationship is weak. It's also complex because multiple factors uh, play a role um, as a mediator between money and happiness. So for instance, how we allocate time, how we spend money also matters. In this case, we would like to focus on cognitive changes. From studies, we know that uh, wealth and privileges can be related to specific behaviors. For instance, wealthy people um, characterized, or can be characterized with an increased desire for solitude. So they want to uh, social isolate more than people um, in, with uh, lower income. Try to think for a second, what would you do um, if you would win a lottery? How would you spend your money? Would it be uh, only for yourself? Maybe you would like to share that with others. What would be the impact of this great amount of money that you can get? Some people think that, yeah, I could uh, fill a bathtub with money, lie in it while smoking a cigar and drinking champagne, build a fort uh, and do other things. Uh, like, for instance, uh, buying a mountain um, or build a house on it. Typically, when people ask this kind of question, they think that they will use the money to buy things. Mostly uh, material things like houses, shopping, boat, uh, and whatever. That's typically uh, what happens. That means that they will use the money to benefit themselves. And thus, it would be buying isolation. Not many uh, people mention when uh, this question uh, is asked. Um, mention friends, family, or giving the lottery money to charity. If you'd like to more, you can also later on click this link that would be shared uh, on the YouTube video in the description. Okay, so we know that uh, wealth is related to increased desire for solitude. What also is really important to understand the complexity about the relationship between money and happiness is that wealth can negatively affect people's behavior. For instance, it reduces the likelihood to help acquaintances, donate to charity, and spend time with others. Third effect, it's related to uh, uh, fundamental attribution error. Research found that basically uh, people who are richer, they tend to or are more susceptible to this fundamental attribution error. So they make this error more often than people uh, not wealthy. To some extent, this effect was uh, confirmed in a monopoly study. They found, for instance, that uh, richer players started to move around the board louder, increase nonverbal and verbal displays of power, dominance and celebration, ate more pretos, become more rude, and afterwards explain how their own behavior led to their success. So, as you see in this uh, example, in this specific study, uh, rich people or wealthy um, were, uh, behaved, uh, um, were behaving in a more antisocial way. So they were rather showing dominance. That can be seen as uh, antisocial behavior. And afterward, they were saying that their success in the Monopoly game was a result of their own abilities 
on specific uh, traits related, for instance, to um, to specific skills uh, like intelligence. Okay, let's end up this um, uh, part of the presentation with taking into account that uh, those people who are wealthy, they have this lower tendency to uh, enjoy um, uh, life's little pleasures. So they spend less time walking around, let's say, drinking a beer with a beautiful uh, view. Maybe they do not have much time for that. As you can conclude, uh, wealthy does not make us more social. We, by isolation, and the question is that, is that an effect that truly changes a character of people who become wealthy, or maybe it changes their perspective, their thinking, their beliefs uh, slightly, and the way how they um, approach uh, other people, um, for instance, their neighbors. This interesting study about queuing consumerism to some extent answer to the question that I asked. Here you can see results from a study by Bauer and colleagues. What they did, they created two experimental conditions. They've asked people to think about uh, luxury consumer goods like expensive cars, watches and whatever. In control groups people were asked to think about neutral stuff. And later on, after this priming, they ask people to reflect uh, on their emotions, for instance, negative emotions. This uh, graph it shows the difference between both conditions. More emotions were expressed by the uh, participants in the experimental group. So while they were thinking about uh, luxury consumer goods, typically they were experiencing more negative emotions. The same difference to the same direction was found for depression level, dissatisfaction with self, materialistic aspirations and competitiveness. So people were uh, uh, thinking that they can or are supposed to compete with their um, uh, peers. On the other hand, they also found a um, different pattern for other variables, so lower positive uh, emotions or uh, less feelings of being responsible for water consumption, so it means that uh, when people were queued uh, with those effects, with thinking about um, uh, goods, uh, also they, uh, they thought that uh, not there, but the neighbors are responsible for um, a reduction of water consumption. The same effects were related to social trust, so there was lower social trust in the experimental condition and viewing others as partners uh, in a specific project. Think for a second about all those effects related to social relationships, specific emotions and think, uh, thinking about um, yourself as a consequence of priming. Why that truly happens? Why this fact, thinking about uh, wealth, can lead to those negative effects? Thank you for your attention.